You're listening to Financial Advisor Marketing, the best show on the planet for financial advisors who want to get more clients without all the stress. You're about to get the real scoop on everything from lead generation to closing the deal. James is the founder of TheAdvisorCoach.com, where you can find an entire suite of products designed to help financial advisors grow their businesses more rapidly than ever before. Now, here is your host, James Pollard. Financial advisors, I have a very special treat for you today. One of my goals for 2023, I mean, this episode is scheduled to come out in May, but I'm recording this earlier in the year, and I really wanted to get more guests on the show who know things that I don't necessarily know that financial advisors haven't been exposed to. And I've gotten to talk with some amazing people about YouTube marketing, marketing to Gen Z, marketing to specific niches, going all in on your niches, targeting the top 0.5% of households, just incredible stuff from incredible guests. And today is no exception. We are over 200 episodes deep in the financial advisor marketing podcast. And I have never talked about Instagram marketing outside of like some businesses that I had in the past and uh, the use Instagram for, but I've never talked about it in the context of helping financial advisors get more clients. But fortunately, I have Claire Balkum here today and she is doing Instagram marketing and she has a lot to say about it and she's going to help me and help you. So Claire, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. Where... Can you tell the audience a little bit about yourself, your background, how you got to where you are today? Yeah. So I actually started in the business, believe it or not, I was actually started as in, in my working life as a florist. I was a floral designer and um, I quickly went on to become a professional actor because, you know, you have to try all kinds of things in life, right? And um, as I was an actor, I figured, you know what, I wanted to be rich and not famous because getting famous is something that is few and far between in that industry, if anyone's ever tried it. So I actually started to trade the stock market and I had a lot of people, I, I had some really good gains in, in all of my trades. I was trading options on the US markets on like a lot of the high beta stocks. So I had a lot of people who were wanting to give me their money because the word got out that I was a good trader. And well, whoops, it turns out you need a license for that. So I, I didn't trade anyone's money without license, uh, just for disclosure. But I did find out that, uh, okay, I need some hours in the business. So I went and I actually started in like a, a chop shop. Like um, uh, there's a movie where, uh, I forget what it's called, uh, where with uh, Vin Diesel uh, and all they're doing is a uh, boiler room. Boiler room. Boiler room, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's and uh, it, it was like boiler room. And I had to work from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. Literally, I was only allowed to make cold calls. I was not allowed to bring in any family. I was only allowed. So I would I would make anyone who's, you know, complaining about making cold calls, which I don't think are working anymore these days. But uh, I made 3,500 cold calls a week. So it was intense. It turned out I obviously didn't stay with them. I didn't like them. I won't name the firm. So I found a firm down the street from me and I walked in there and I said, yeah, this is my background. I used to be a, an options trader. I still am an options trader. So let's get going. So they obviously welcomed me with open arms. And I figured I'd go in there and I would just make my hours in the business and I would leave and I would go start a hedge fund because that was the world that I felt like I belonged in based on my trading background. But then I met my mentor who had one of the largest books of business in Canada and he started teaching me these strategies that were just, they were unreal. I'd never heard of anything like them. Even when I tell other advisors today about these strategies, they kind of, their eyes get crossed. And I remember asking my mentor at the time, I'd be with this guy like day after day, just listening in on appointments, just learning his strategy. I'd go home and I'd do them at night. And I remember asking him, why do you not see other advisors doing this stuff? And he said, because honestly, Claire, they're mentally lazy. He says, don't take that the wrong way. I'm not trying to be mean to other advisors, but they're mentally lazy. They will not do the work. They want to bring in money and they'll just manage it. They'll put it in a balance fund and then that's it. So they won't do everything else in order to help someone to truly become wealthy. So that was it for me. Once I met him, I just decided this is it. Yeah, this is what I want to do. So um, I've been in the business for almost 10 years now. It'll be 10 years, I think, in April. And I guess 10 years by the time the episode comes out. And um, I've switched firms a couple of times, um, picked up some books, little books of business here and there. And that was kind of how I got my start. Why do you think a lot, and this is not just advisors, it's entrepreneurs and people from all walks of life. Why do you think so many people are just mentally lazy? 
I think that as soon as people are faced with any kind of adversity, take going to the gym. I was telling you earlier that I used to be a fitness athlete. People will ask me constantly, how do I lose weight? And I'll tell them, just change your diet to this and go to the gym. You don't even have to go to the gym. Just work out at home. There's so many programs at home that you can do. And people, I just don't think people have the motivation that they need these days. Do you know how many diets that my husband and I have done for people and they just, they won't follow, you know, they won't follow it. But this is also a plus, I think, as an advisor, because no one's really going to do it themselves. People are too busy. I think, so sorry, to answer your question, I think people are too busy and I think people are unhappy with their lives. So I think that they're going home and they're delving into things like a show. Like James, how, how I, I don't know if you watch TV or not, but it's so much easier to just lose yourself in a show or a movie and just fantasize about, oh, this could be my life, right? That kind of thing. Absolutely. It, it's just, I like to frame it as an advantage because if you can do the hard stuff, then you are set apart from everyone else because yeah. they're not willing to do it. If you look around and 99 out of 100 people are mentally lazy and don't do the things required to be successful, if you can just do that, then you're so set apart. So, And that sounds like what you did. Exactly. exactly. And I do that in, I try to do that in all aspects of my life, which is not easy and it makes you a real overachiever. But it's, like I even, I homeschool my kid. Oh, that's awesome. He's only three, but you know what? I see what's going on in the school systems and I'm not impressed. I, I was, I was going to bring him to um, uh, either a private school. Like I, I was looking at uh, what's called Waldorf or Montessori. I love them both. I think they're really interesting the way they teach the kids. The Waldorf school looked really grungy and the the lady who gave us the tour was not super friendly. Uh, and the lady who was the Montessori, she kept spelling his, my son's name is Henrik, H-E-N-R-I-K. She kept spelling his name wrong. And I thought, you are not going to pay attention to my kid the way I will. Even though I'm home running a business or at the office or whatever, my husband also works from home. So we found a way to... We just, we like to work differently than anyone else. But I think that that is also the advantage that you just mentioned. Well, I think homeschooling is awesome. Uh, my yeah. wife worked in the education industry and I'm super passionate about like first book and donors twos and all this stuff. Uh, but I can tell you, no one's going to care as much as you. It's assuming that you have the background, assuming you have the will, the drive, the materials to do it. Homeschooling is the way to go. The problem is that most people just don't have that, this stuff, but if you have it, then, oh my goodness absolutely do it. Yeah. So let's get back to marketing here. Before we get into Instagram, I want to ask you, which marketing strategies outside of Instagram did you use? What tended to work well for you and what didn't work at all? Yeah. <laughs> Cold calling did not work at all. I mm. think out of those 3,500, I probably got one. So you can do the math on what the, the return on investment is on that. I think cold calling is... For me, I don't know, James, maybe if they train with you, if you're into cold calling, that would maybe work because I see, you know, what your talent is, but in teaching people. So for me, that didn't work. I always put the test past myself. Could a cold caller get through me? They wouldn't, they just, they just wouldn't. I'm, I'm yeah, actually right. brutal. If you get me on the phone, I'm brutal. Like I would not want to have me on the phone. What did work for me was before COVID, obviously, was um, we did a lot of uh, dinner seminars and um, like a, like coffee, that kind of thing, coffee, water, whatever seminar. That works tremendously well for me. I'm in, I'm from Ontario. Uh, my, my main business is on, in Ontario, but I have clients across Canada. I remember I had absolutely no clients in Vancouver and I went prospecting. Then I just started going out and inviting people to like a chic, luxurious dinner at the um, the Fairmont waterfront. And it was like a, it was going to be like a steak dinner situation. And we actually got about 52 people there out of knowing no one. And that was over two days of prospecting. And we were focused on a certain niche at that time as well. That was in a, a, a province that I wasn't from, didn't know anyone in. And um, we just happened to be going out there for a, a conference later that year. So we thought, well, let's put a, a seminar together and get some business out of it as well. Um, but doing that in Ontario was my huge, um, getting people to a seminar that either I'm speaking at or my mentor was speaking at, I think selling someone else, you know, you always hear about that, uh, have a buddy, have an advisor buddy who you work with. I think that works, especially if you, I, my confidence wasn't up yet. I was a few years in the business 
inviting someone to say, you've got to come and hear my mentor speak. He's amazing. You'll, you'll, you'll never hear anything like it. So selling someone else at the time when I was new really helped me. I got a lot of business from those, but a lot of them were people I knew and friends of people I knew. Yeah. You know, so-and-so just bring them kind of thing. So I, I made it, it wasn't so formal. I, I always, my, as you can probably tell by my personality, things are always a little bit more casual for me. I don't think there's a need to scare people into coming to a seminar or becoming your client. Yeah. I mean, some, sometimes people will poke fun at the dinner, dinner seminars, like, oh, free steak dinner, but they do work if positioned correctly. Yeah. Just like cold calls, direct mail, email. I mean, you name it, anything can work if you work and you obviously made it work. I also want to point out to financial advisors who are listening, the buddy system that you're referencing that absolutely does work. It works really well with seminars, obviously. It works really well with direct mail. Uh, legendary marketer Dan Kennedy talked about one of his most successful mailings is something called the Al the Plumber mailing. And it's basically Al, it's like a chain mailing from people, so on and so forth. You can Google it and figure it out. It also works really well in webinars. So these are called joint ventures where people will basically get together and have a, that's why you see the webinars all over the financial services industry, where there are two people or they bring on a guest. And they, that's the reason why it works. So thank you so much for bringing that up. How did you pivot into Instagram? I, I saw, I was on, I was on Facebook and I saw a lot of people on Instagram. And I kept hearing about Instagram, Instagram, like, what is this Instagram? Like it was, it was kind of starting to annoy me actually. So I got on there personally and I just started posting. If you go really far back in my feed, I started posting just things I liked because I didn't know how to use it. I didn't know what to do with it. And you'll notice that I start to change a little bit later into a little bit more financial related, but really I started personally because I had heard about it. And then I was on, like I said, I was on Facebook and then I really started to see the opportunity. I started to see how many followers some people had. I don't even have that many followers, but I know because I've, I've read your, your um, emails and your, all of your, your material on your website that having, you know, a thousand or uh, 10,000 followers doesn't matter if nobody's engaged. If mm -hmm. I only have 1400 followers, but there's a lot of engagement there. Right. Absolutely. That's a good point. When you got started with Instagram, you and I want financial advisors to pay attention to the strategy behind what you're saying. You're saying that you you experimented with it. You weren't afraid to learn what, how to use it, what to do with it. When I Google, did, I do research on my podcast guest, and I found your what I believe to be a personal account. So like at Claire Balcom, but there's also a link to at Clear Wealth Group. Yeah. Which one do you prioritize for getting clients, the personal one or the business one? Yeah. So it's the personal one. Wow. That's interesting. Yes. yes. I could have guessed that, but a lot of people probably would not have not have guessed that no. that way. I know. Clear Wealth Group is my company. So the way it works is for us is uh, Clear Wealth Group works under, um, I'm currently with Mandeville Private Client. So I don't want to call them my back office, but kind of in a way it works like that. So I can have my corporation inside of that firm, right? Sure. So and there's reasons I chose that firm over others, but that's another, that's for another day. But at Claire Bauckham, the thing is this, first of all, at Claire Bauckham has more followers. However, people want to see you as a person before they want to see you as a corporation. I think the corporate, the corporation is strictly financial and I don't keep it that up to date. And the reason is because I have to put every piece through compliance, every period exclamation mark has to go through compliance. Whereas with at Claire Bauckham, because it's personal, it doesn't always have to go through compliance. Now, my financial related posts with at Claire Bauckham, I do a lot on stories. So they're not permanent. If there is something that I want, that's going to be really heavy on financial and it's going to have any figures in it, then yes, I have to put it through compliance. But Honestly, the reason mainly is because people want to see you as a person and not a corporation. The corporation, it, I look at my clear wealth and I just person, I told you, I, I pass everything through myself personally and I see how I would feel about it. At clear wealth is, it's awesome. And there's some really good strategies on there, but it's not a person. And I want to connect to a human. Yeah, absolutely. It, it, so the business account, the way that I view it is just like, something that makes you legitimate. It's like, exactly. hey, if you're, yeah. if you're here, if you really want to check out my business page, this is where to go. Yep. But 
I, I do think that more financial advisors could benefit by realizing that, yeah, people do want to see you as a human first. And yeah. one of the, this is very interesting because I come from the marketing world, very heavy in that for better or worse, I have now like either branded myself or been branded as like email marketing for financial advisors. And I appreciate that. I like that. And I've noticed that the most successful emails don't talk about money at all. They don't talk about investments at all. And people yeah. say, well, oh, but not a little, even just a little bit. No, not even a little bit. They're talking about restaurants. They're talking about recipes. They're talking about pets. They're talking about your kids, talking yeah. about where you went to high school, interesting stories from high school, talking about which TV shows you watch. But like when I say this, a lot of people don't believe me, but it's cool to see like on Instagram, it makes perfect sense because it's visual, highly visual because it's just photos and video. So if you're a business account, I'm trying to think what, like if I had like the advisor coach business account, what would I post? Like, I don't know. But if I had like James Pollard at Instagram, which I don't, if you're listening, I could just take a video. If yeah. I see something, take a video. If I'm out somewhere, take a photo and people would respond to that. And I'm, I'm sure they do with you too. They do. My best responses are from personal posts. So as soon as you, if you see a picture of me on there, you'll see that I get the most likes and comments on that. So when I, I do also a lot of motivational, it's just, I think if you guys are trying to do to the audience, like if you guys are trying to do your personal Instagram, stop posting like your plate of food. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, it's, <laughs> It's really pretty and everything. And I'm sure it's like, I sometimes I post food because I'm a fitness person and I'm drooling over a burger or pizza that I can't have until my cheat meal or whatever. But people know me for that, right? So people truly want to know who you are. I've had so many people say two things to me. Oh my gosh, Claire, you're so transparent. I love it. I feel like I know you. People want to feel like you're a celebrity. Oh, I work with Claire Bauckham. Oh yeah, don't, you should, I had a girl go get her a pedicure done close to my office. She went, uh, sorry, a girl from my old office at my old firm. And she came back to the office and she says, what's with you? And I said, what? And she says, well, I went in to get a pedicure. And they're like, oh my God, do you know Claire Baca? She's like, what are you talking? Yeah, I know Claire. Oh, because she says that it's worth it to fly first class. Cause that's my thing. My thing mm. is how can we get into more? I want to get a private jet. How can I get a private jet? How can we, like I am right now, I'm in Mexico living here for two months, January and February, and I'm working down here. How can you make these things possible in your life? How can you get more? How can you make more money? You want to buy a house on the lake? I do. I'm looking at one right now. It's not for sale. I want to get it. People will find all of this out about you on your personal, your corporate or your professional, whatever you want to call it. Instagram is going to be strictly that strictly about your business. You know, we keep it professional. We do the Merry Christmas thing or, you know, whatever, the Happy New Year, all of that stuff, just to make sure people know that we're a real company and we're alive. Like you said, you it exist, yeah. yes, exactly. Because they're going to look and P and I looked as soon as I found out about you, James, I looked up your Instagram. I didn't find one, obviously, but then I realized that you do most of your stuff on um, LinkedIn or whatever. But yeah, don't we can't be posting things. You have to post things that you think this is kind of weird. You have to post things that people you want to be known for. And it's taken me a very long time and a lot of research to figure out who I am through all of my acting days as well. Um, my director is actually incredible. I'm still into one of my main directors. He was a private coach as well for me. He still helps me figure out who that person is. So that all gets kind of like molded into whatever I post. You know, I'm I'm down in Mexico right now and I'm posting a lot of that. But a lot of people are just like, oh my God, how do I live that lifestyle? That's what you want. Look at the accounts that you're following. If you're thinking to yourself, oh, I love this account because look at them. Why do you love the accounts that you're 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 following? I love this account because they're living this lifestyle. Oh man, I wish I could live like that. People will want to see, especially financial advisors, it's such a a cold industry. It's so cold, professional. It's like, uh, I re it reminds me of like, it, we're just, we're not relatable usually. So like very you, robotic, very robotic. As soon as you become relatable, people have approached me because of that. You know, Claire, I feel like I can ask you this because, you know, I, people have told me, I feel like you're relatable. The second thing is I get a lot of people saying, I feel like you posted today's, whatever I posted that day. For, I do it. Like I said, a lot of motivational, I feel like you posted that directly for me. 
because I go after a lot of business owners, small business owners. I get a lot of, I get a lot of everything to be honest, but I have a specific niche, obviously, but I get, yeah, I get people who I, I, I feel like you put, do you know what's going on in my life? Cause I feel like you posted that for me. And I'm like, yeah, of course I know what's going on in your life. So yeah. yeah. Cause I work with people just like you exactly. and you see that and you're, exactly. this is a proof of concept. Yeah, exactly. Take me back to the first class, flying first class thing. How did you get known for that? What exactly is that? Because I, I want to learn more. Yeah. Like, <laughs> like, um, what, you know. said it's it's worth it to fly first class. First class. Yeah. Well, here's the thing. Once you sit in those bigger seats and you get that hot meal and you get the treatment and you get to get on the plane first and off the plane first and you don't have to line up at security. Once you get that treatment, that's a mindset. You cannot, I, I don't know about you, I, I cannot walk past the first class seats into economy. I had to, and it was a very bad situation. Uh, and that was only actually because we were actually down here. We had to put my mom in the hospital. She ended up passing away a couple months later. She had um, uh, lung cancer metastasized to the brain. I had to take an emergency flight home. We sent her home on a private jet with my dad. And um, I had to take, I won't mention the the airline, I had to take the very tiny seat home and I had a, a six month old baby and it was the worst experience of my life. And my brother's like, I don't know why you fly, fly first class. This is amazing. <laughs> I thought was so you, you simply cannot walk past that. It's not, people are like, oh, it's not worth it. You know, you're paying an extra, whatever, three, four, six hundred dollars more and it's I could buy a I could buy a hot meal and bring it on there. Guys, you're missing the point completely. It's not about the meal and the hot towel and all that and the private bathroom and all. It's not about that. It's about a mindset. It's about leveling yourself, leveling your mindset up. You once you sit there, you belong in that crowd. You're making that kind of money. You can't go back. If you're making 60 grand a year and you're like, okay, I need to make 80 grand, 100 grand a year in order for me to sit in first class. You're not going to go back to 60 grand a year. You just can't. There's an old saying. It's always about about finding a way. No. Yeah. (laughs) So I, I will admit, I have a personal rule. If the flight is about two hours. So here's the thing. I live in Delaware and I fly to Florida a lot. And a flight to Florida is like two hours and 30 minutes, two hours and 15 minutes. I don't remember ever flying first yeah. class to Florida because it's such a short flight. But if it's like five hours, like to, to LAX yeah. from Philly is five hours and 53 minutes. I'm sorry. I'm not going to do that in the Southwest. I'm just not, period. Yeah. Yeah. So that's that's how I approach it. If it's a short flight, then no, I don't fly first class. I'm just being transparent with you. But if it's long, yeah, yeah. Oh boy, it's worth it. A hundred percent. Like You don't go back Listen, to that. Inside Canada, flying first class it, it it will, it's literally like you have to take out another mortgage. So if for yeah. us domestic flights, it doesn't always make sense. So let yeah. me, let me actually, yeah. Yeah. Let me say that as well. I totally agree with you. If it's a shorter flight, forget about it. I do, um, I do a priority, uh, what's it called? Like the uh, economy, premium yeah, economy. Right. Yeah. yeah. Like the front, the front like of it. Yeah. This things like that, where you have a little bit more leg. My husband's six, five, so I can't get away with sitting in the back anyway. But um, no, on longer flights, especially because we own our place down here, it just, I, that's where we do the splurge. Yeah, I, I totally agree. agree. So we're, we're on the same, we're on the yeah, same yeah. page with that. Yeah. Hey, financial advisors. If you'd like even more help building your business, I invite you to subscribe to James's monthly paper and ink newsletter, The James Pollard Inner Circle. When you join today, you'll get more than $1,000 worth of bonuses, including exclusive interviews that aren't available anywhere else. Head on over to theadvisorcoach.com slash coaching to learn more. But it is it is a mindset. And I want to talk about this. I know the episode is titled like how to get clients with Instagram marketing, but I really want to talk about this because I think it's important for financial advisors to get that mindset. And it's going to be different for everyone. Everybody has different things that they splurge on. I've spent an ungodly amount of money on my bedroom and not in a naughty way, uh, just like the equipment, like the the mattress and the blinds and <laughs> yeah. the, the, all this fancy stuff. It's like yeah. insane. And most people, would, they don't want to do that. But it's important to me. Literally today, I bought a brand new desk. One of my pet peeves is when people do research, like, let's just say something is, I don't know, $100. And they spend eight hours researching it. That's that's nuts to me. I can't do yeah. that. I don't want to yeah. do that. 
the desk I bought today was several thousand dollars because I like tricked it out and did some fancy stuff to it. I told myself in advance, I don't want to spend more than 20 minutes buying this. I'm going to buy it. I want to get it done. If it's, if it doesn't work, then I'll send it back, but I'm not going to spend a week trying to figure out, oh, should I get this hook or should I get the J hook or should I get the V hook? Should yeah. I get this drawer organizer in bamboo or should I get it in laminate? I don't want to do any of that. So everybody has their, their own like things that are important to them. You have to decide what that is and you have to know what it is for your clients. So I imagine yeah. if you're working with business owners, they prioritize stuff in their business and business productivity. They also probably prioritize playing harder because these people probably work harder yeah. and you know that. Yeah, exactly. Actually on that point, I get someone to do my groceries for me when I'm at home and I'm really missing it when I live here. Uh, Cause I don't have anyone to do that and I have to do it. And I hate it because it takes me to, to at home. It would take me two hours round trip. Plus I don't want to do it. I pay someone, I think 20, $30 Canadian tip kind of thing. Oh, but you could get groceries with that guys. Again, people say this stuff to me and guys, you're missing the point. It's yeah. time. It's frustration it, during COVID. I don't want to go out there. I've got a three-year-old blah, blah, blah. It's just, there are so many things. I think financial advisors, they step over dollars to pick up pennies or yeah. loonies, I guess. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Loonies. It, that's right. Loonies. Yeah. <laughs> I got that right. So yeah. what's interesting with the Instagram thing is I see a lot of parallels. Uh, so Instagram, again, I want to stress is highly visual and it's important for people to understand that you're posting content about you. You're posting content about what you believe. You're posting content that resonates with a certain audience. What type of content doesn't work well on Instagram? Honestly, the I thought the motivational posts did not work well. And then I started hearing feedback from people that, like I said before, that I felt like you were speaking to me. And yeah, you know what? I need to hustle up. My whole thing is, is hustle up. I have have someone who is trying to sell me these, you know, manifest, become a manifestation coach. Cause I'm already kind of coaching people in a way. Right. And they're, they're saying to me, well, you shouldn't have to work that hard guys. You always have to put in the work. Right. So which posts the, the posts that are, I don't, I'm not great with what isn't working. I'm sure I could go through my feed and tell you what has the least likes, but the most likes, which I mentioned are personal. The other ones that get a lot actually are financial related, but striking a, an emotional chord with people. Mm, mm -hmm. So for example, this one, like this one actually hurts me is that I saw a picture of, um, there's two, when people do a GoFundMe because they have cancer and they need money, why do you not have CI insurance? What happened? Like, why are you waiting to get cancer for you to get a CI policy, a critical illness policy? And that's just a small one, as you know. Yeah. The other one is I've seen kids. Oh, this is hard. It's hard because I have a small child. Seeing a little guy, a picture of a little guy in a diaper with, with no hair, bent over the toilet, throwing up because he's got cancer and he's doing chemo. And the parents are, oh, this is, you know, little Joe and he's super sick and I'm thinking to myself, parents, you have these kids, you buy them the toys and all that. Please, for the love of all things holy, get them a CI policy for a hundred grand so that when, if they get sick, I don't want, I, I don't like, because I say when for adults, because the likelihood of us getting sick is about 60% with cancer, but sure, or more now, if the little one gets sick, you want to be able to be off work. Don't be worrying about, I, I saw James, I saw, I saw a family in my own town at home doing a bottle drive to try and collect money because their little guy needed a special treatment for his cancer. Like as a parent, your heart is being crushed when you see something like that. So those types of, I, I, I see things online. I follow very uncomfortable content like that. And I expose myself to it because then it strikes a chord in me emotionally, which prompts me to do a post, which prompts other people. I probably got about three different of, the, of my last, I think it was a story I did. I had three different people come to me and say, oh my gosh, I need CI insurance. And by the way, let's just look at the rest of my stuff as well. Yeah. Like while I'm here. And that's a good point. I mean, people yeah. buy the toys and they have the Netflix and they have the streaming services, but like they, those things don't matter in the grand scheme of things. No. And you're you're protecting an asymmetric downside. Like when things go wrong, 
they go really, really wrong. Yeah. And it is important to have people like you and other financial advisors in the world to basically protect against those downsides. Yeah. That's actually, I didn't even think about that at all with Instagram. And it makes a lot of sense because for better or worse, and we don't have time to go down this rabbit hole today, but the way social media networks work is they basically play off your emotion. Uh, on Twitter, essentially, what I've noticed is a lot of political posts basically reinforcing stuff that you don't believe in, meaning if you're a super left, left-wing left cons- uh, liberal or whatever they're called nowadays, I don't even know, or conservative, I don't even know what these words are, but what is a wing? Do we have wings? I'm not sure. Yeah. But <laughs> they will show you the opposite of whatever it is that they have found out through their data. They'll show you the opposite just to get you outraged. So Instagram will do that with emotions and positive emotions, negative emotions, Uh, A question I have for you that's not content related necessarily is, do you have a direct messaging strategy on LinkedIn or on uh, Instagram? So you mean, do I start messaging people directly in order to get business? Sure. Well, that or like DM me for more info or like link in bio. I'm not sure. Again, I'm not on James Pollard. I'm as a person, I'm not on Instagram. So I'm just asking. I don't even know. No. Once in a while, I'll put a, just DM me if you want more information, just because it's too much information. I do not have the strategy. And I think the reason is because I see too much of it. And I see too many people hammering other people's inboxes. And that has become the new cold calling. How many do you get where even for you on your LinkedIn? Oh my gosh, I get so many and I can't stand that. I don't even read them anymore. Oh, you, you look pretty. You look like you'd be good for our jewelry campaign, like whatever. So I just delete, delete, delete. So I don't want to be, I don't want to give someone that negative connotation about me and what I'm doing. So no, I don't have a DM strategy. Well, what's interesting is that the people who tend to be most successful with social media, this is very weird. This is one of those things where I have to trust the data, but then my eyes kind of deceive me. What's interesting is that all of the data suggests that the financial advisors who see successful with social media, they do engage in some sort of direct message strategy. It's like 94%. But the interviews that I've had, and this is like through like the advisor coach and podcasts like this, and even like private like consulting gigs, because like the people who pay me, like they are doing other things and they're just in another universe. They don't. So I'm in like a weird headspace because I see the data. I know the data. I know that direct messaging stuff can work, but the people who really are like upper echelon, they they don't. I had a guest on a, either last week or a couple of weeks ago, and he talked about Twitter marketing, and he's just killing it on Twitter. It's just like amazing. He doesn't message at all. Like, hmm. Well, wait a minute. You know. So it's just one of those things where like the above average, sure they do it, but it's just like killing it. Not necessarily. So it is interesting. It is interesting. So if you don't have a DM strategy, what is your overall sequence for getting someone to turn from a visitor to your Instagram profile into a client? I will, I usually get a message about something that I've posted. And then I'm the same as I actually do the same thing as I have a very high close rate. So I, I will give them the information they're looking for. I'm not trying to hold things back. I notice a lot of people will do that. If I'm looking for some information, I'm either given off to um, someone else to answer the question for me, who's not answering the question for me, or they're just not, they just, people are withholding this information. I have, I don't know if you know Grant Cardone uh, and Gary Vaynerchuk. I, I know more Cardone than Vaynerchuk. Yeah, they just, they give the information. There's enough people out there. I have this thing about karma as well. Give people what they need. If it's meant to be, you know, it'll it'll be, and they'll come back to you, right? You have to have enough in your pipeline that you're, you're not dying for that one prospect that has Bingo. asked you the one question. Like have your pipeline so full that it's like, okay, whatever, next. Not whatever in a mean way. Just if you don't want to work with me, it's all good. Uh, if you don't want to go to the, my, my mentor, I was just say, if you don't want to go to the prom with me, I don't want to go to the prom with you. You want to go on a date with me? I don't want to go on a date with you. It's all good. There's no hard feelings. 
So I give them what they need and I just say, yeah, they, you should have a, they should have this, you should have that. This is, you know, or I'll say like, I can't always explain it through direct messaging. I'll say to them, look, you know, the markets are down and this is literally one of the single best investing opportunities that you've had in a decade. <laughs> so since 2008, 2009, basically. So I hope that your portfolio is set up that way. And if they want more information, they'll ask. If they're scared, they may not, you know? So I sometimes will follow up and just say, hey, just let me know if you have any questions. And I let it go. If you love something, let it go. And if it, if it loves you, it'll return back to you, right? Yeah. And you have marketing assets that follow up. You you may not follow up manually, but your assets are still there. If they're they want to learn more, the they can go back. They're yeah. seeing the other posts. Yeah. Exactly. You asked me earlier about, just to go back really quick, sorry, that you asked me earlier about what's not working just really quickly for advisors, I think everyone's using Instagram wrong. Very, very wrong. I will post a story and I will tag 20 people in it. And you can't always see those tags. It goes behind the scenes. That means as another business, you got to repost it. People are not reposting other people. So Instagram is a tough gig, I think, because there's not a lot of education. People are not using it properly. If I post something and I tag you, James Pollard, done. You should be reposting for me. I mean, not we're kind of a related-ish business, right? If I'm posting, like I posted Mercedes Benz because I said that my next my next car that I wanted was going to be the Mercedes Benz Maybach. Definitely, that's what I'm getting, right? I just like I'm I have a Benz now. That's what I that's what I like, and I have a Mini. They reposted it for me, so now all of their followers oh, saw cool. me. Yes, this is a huge thing repost people. If you want to get more followers, engage. Like I got 1400 followers from scratch. Okay. And that's for, as a financial advisor, that's, that's decent. Yeah. Uh, yes. I'm trying to keep growing. I grew, I think I had about 150 followers in the last two months, just because I'm doing more post often post a lot of stories. The reels are huge. We need to do a whole other episode on this, James. There is a strategy. I do a lot of research on how to and what works and what doesn't work. And that's why I've been growing my engagement. I have in my, when I first started getting really heavily into Instagram a few years ago, I think I got about $2.5 million out of it, which is not, not a, a heck of a lot. Um, as Canadians, the average advisor will write about 3 million a year. So I did not know that. I didn't know that. You know, I, I mean, getting, I didn't know the Canadian yeah. stats. Hmm. Yeah. That is and also, I do not pay for sponsored ads yet. I am going to because I'm now I'm at a level where I want to start really, you know, getting this going, but I do not pay for ads. So if you think that you need to go in there and spend a bunch of money, you don't. You need to engage people and it's got to be on a personal level. You have to have a proof of concept. So yeah. I love online advertising. I've spent a boatload of money on online advertising. Yeah. It's one of the things that we, I brought up like the consult stuff. Essentially, for if it's weird because people will basically come to me and say, "Can you just look at my ad account?" And I'm like, "Okay, sure, I'll do that." Yeah. But you have to have a proof of concept. I cannot stress that enough. You have to have something that is working. You don't want to start throwing money at the wall with ads and have nothing. If you have a blog post, let's say you have ten blog posts on your website and one of them does really well, sure, run ads. But don't start on day one and say, hmm, I wonder if this will work. You have to have something. So thank you for bringing I, that up. I think we're all looking for the easy way out because we're just trying to be, we're trying to just do our business. But I have someone in the background who basically does all of the admin, like the business business. And basically my job as the advisor is marketing, which is prospecting kind of, and sales. Sales meaning speaking to the people. And getting people. them to do yeah. what they need to do to make themselves wealthy and in a good position. Sure. Yeah. You brought up Grant Cardone and Gary Vaynerchuk. I don't know enough about Gary Vaynerchuk. I have read a couple of his books, but I am I do know a little bit about Grant Cardone and I did follow him for a number of years. What's one thing that you've learned from Grant that has helped you? I love Grant Cardone. My husband and I both love him so much. We have every one of his books. I feel like there's a similarity in our personalities. Yes. Think, yep. Yeah. He's a little bit more, <laughs> but mm -hmm. the one thing I've taken from him, I loved his book, The 10X Rule. Me too. You, he, 
I, I, I even say this to clients or because I have other advisors who I sometimes not mentor, but I'll help them out. No problem. Just younger advisors who are just trying to get going and they just can't seem to find their way. And I say, listen, Grant Cardone says, if people don't know you, they can't flow you. Can't flow you. Yeah. Yeah. That's so, my number one. Get in front of as many eyeballs as you can. This is interesting because this is going to be a little story or fun fact about me for financial advisors that might not know. I bought a bunch of stuff from Grant Cardone. Every single book, I mean, 10 X rule, in my opinion, is the best. You have to get the audio version because he him reading it is better than you, know, you reading it reading and trying it, yeah. to hear the voice in your head. So anyway, one of the products that he had was something called the Wealth Creation Formula. And this is a course. And it basically stresses things like start with one flow of income, build that flow, add a parallel flow. A lot of people mess this up. They don't add a parallel flow and parallel flow is something that hooks onto an existing business. People will basically start a Shopify store and then try to start uh, another, like an ice cream truck or like a food truck. And it's, that's, don't do that. Have yeah. a parallel business. One of my secrets of my personal success is directly from the wealth creation formula, because I am basically taking marketing skills and applying them to multiple businesses. I mean, before we started recording, I shared with you like two businesses that yeah. I had yeah. That I don't have many more, but I had that were using Instagram marketing. Those were parallel flows, not because they're in the financial services industry, but because I'm literally just taking the marketing concept and applying them to the businesses. And that I, I thank Grant Cardone for that. I know a lot of people point out his flaws. He seems kind of scummy sometimes, but I've, I'm a believer that you can learn from everyone. He yeah. obviously has some positive traits because you don't get to where you are by being garbage in every aspect of your life. You just don't, period. So yeah. I wish people saw beyond that and realized that like he's got some positive qualities you can learn. And the 10X rule was amazing. The wealth creation formula did change my life. And so I'm forever, forever grateful for that. Can you give an example of a sorry to put you on the spot, but a parallel business for a financial advisor? Partnerships with uh, other strategic alliances and like centers of influence. You could do that. Uh, content Account creation. Accountants, lawyers, that kind of thing. Content creation. Sure. Yeah. yeah, cool. So content creation, there are financial advisors who have big YouTube channels who, now you're not going to make a bunch of money from YouTube, but you have to understand. Yeah. Let me yeah. put it to you this way. I am actually behind the scenes. I'm trying to do some stuff with YouTube right now in unrelated businesses, not in the financial services space. But think about it this way. If I wanted to make $25,000 or I wanted to get $25,000 per year uh, based on the 4% rule, I would need to have $625,000 worth of cash money invested. Okay. What is easier for me to build a YouTube channel that generates $25,000 per year or get my hands on $625,000? In my opinion, it's easier for me to get that asset, the YouTube channel to $25,000 because here's the beautiful thing. If I take $625,000 and I put it in a relatively con conservative investment and I'm withdrawing from it and maybe it grows a little bit, whatever, it's not going to get to a million dollars in a year or two. Yeah. But that $25,000 could get to forty dollars in a year. It could get to forty five dollars in the year after that and then sixty. dollars Who knows if I keep growing it. But in my opinion, getting that income stream that is equivalent to a nest egg yeah. is a heck of a lot easier. So there's that. Um, there are financial advisors who have written books. There are financial advisors who... Now, this is tricky in the United States. I'm not sure about Canada. Affiliate relationships are typically a big no-no, but you have to structure them correctly. If a financial advisor is known for a certain hobby, meaning like, I don't know, fishing, for example, yeah, there are ways to just plug fishing-related stuff on your blog, on your, in your content. Uh, you can have like an Amazon Associates link where it just says, Hey, this is the fishing reel that I use in case you're interested by that. This, this is not like life-changing money, but the yeah. way that I view it is just, it's the equivalent to a 4% rule distribution. I could work my butt off to get to $10 million or I could create multiple businesses to make me $400,000 per year passively. Yeah. What's easier? Yeah. 10 million, yeah. 400,000 passively. Yeah. Like, so that's but where that's, I come from. That's the great thing is that as you're going forward and you're building that, you'll probably eventually get to 10 million anyway, because you're probably exactly. not going to be right. So right. yeah, yeah, that's great. I love this that. This has been an amazing 
conversation. I hope a lot of financial advisors get stuff from it. And one thing I have noticed, you asked me off the air, is like, with in case clients find me, what happens is they search your name and stuff like this will come up in like search engines. So they'll, be like, they'll say like, oh, Claire was on a podcast. Let me listen to this. Nice. So wh- how can people get in touch with you if they want to learn more about you, anything? Yeah, you can find me if you want on Instagram, Claire Bauckham, at Claire Bauckham, which is C-L-A-R-E-B-A-U-K-H-A-M. There's no I in Claire, please. Or direct, you could actually check out my website as well, clearwealthgroup.com. And you can find my email through there as well. You heard her at Claire Bauckham on Instagram and clearwealthgroup.com. Very easy website URL to remember. So I, I am appreciative of that. Financial advisors, I hope you have enjoyed this episode. It has been absolute gold, all about Instagram marketing. I hope you got as much out of it as I did, and I will catch you next week. This is the podcastfactory.com.